This morning, we have two major issues we're looking at. We'll start off with a look at um, the incidence of road accidents in the country and also we'll turn our attention to voter registration matters. And to help me have this conversation in the studio seated next to me, we have from my extreme left, Superintendent Alex Obing. He is the Director of Education Research and Training at the Motor Transport and Traffic Department of the Ghana Police Service. Next is Henry Asumini. He is with the National Road Safety Authority. And to my right, we have Robert Sabah. He is the National Vice Chairman of the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, GPRTU. Good morning, gentlemen, Good and morning. welcome to the show. It's, it's, it's great to have you here. Um, in respect of the first conversation we're going to have, uh, essentially, I think this has been an issue that we've always <coughs> talked about. But for this week, it has started by reason of an accident <coughs> that occurred on Tuesday, the 14th of January, 2020. Um, on the Akrata Krede Highway, which involved uh, two 60-seater passenger buses traveling um, on the opposite or from the opposite directions of this highway, a number of fatalities recorded over 30, 30 over 30 fatalities, and a number of injuries also recorded. Indeed, it has been a devastating uh, situation. It's got the whole country talking, and so this morning we're trying to, you know bring that, that conversation to the fore to understand what it is that is causing these increasing incidents of road accidents in Ghana. And so we'll be taking some um, videos and pictures in respect of this incident which happened on the Accra Takrade Highway. Then we uh, come to our panelists in the studio. So let's take a listen to some um, stories or some bites that we have in respect of this matter. What are you to do? Oh, my God! You are a good person! Oh, my God! I'm not going to die. 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 Our deep no, uh, sorrow and that of the president and government to all those who might have died in this uh, unfortunate accident and those who have sustained uh, injuries we extend that feeling of condolence to their families and we will follow up from here to the hospital to visit uh, those who have been hospitalized but on my part, and I know my colleague, the transport uh, minister, will come in. Uh, the police under MTTD may do their work. The uh, Road Safety Authority, uh, under the able leadership of the Director General, this is to agree upon. We all know the excellent work that authority is doing in our country. There's no doubt about that. But no matter the extent of education that we carry out, if at the end of the day, the drivers who are manning these commercial vehicles don't take advantage of this intensive and extensive education, then we will continue to have these problems. It's regrettable that the more we try to improve the roads, the more we get fatal accidents. Government may do whatever he needs to do. You just accuse government that you haven't done anything. What about the driver, your destiny, your own life? Well, like I said, one person may cause the life of about 45 people. In this case, about 35 people have lost their life due to the carelessness of one person. And the media may criticize government, yes. You can criticize government that you haven't done anything. Government has not done road marking. Government is not doing it. Please, I'm appealing to you that use the same media to advise the drivers. 
that the government may be not the government may not be doing the best. But please tell them to take their destiny into their own hands so that they may protect others. Because the, the passengers in the car may be your relative, may be my relative. I don't know what happens. So you saw some um, family friends grieving over the loss of their loved ones, and indeed there was also the Minister for Roads and Transport in there speaking to the issue. Let me quickly announce uh, the presence of our fourth panelist in the person of Abraham Zato. He is the Deputy Director of Research, Business Development and Innovation with the DVLA. Good morning, sir, and welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you. Great to have you here. Obviously, um, a, a sad situation we have on our hands here, but let's first of all um, extend our condolences to the bereaved families. <coughs> Indeed, it's a tough situation and we hope you pull through. Uh, we hope you know you have the needed comfort and, and solace from, <coughs> from, from, the, from the good Lord Almighty. Indeed, it's, it's a tough one. Superintendent, I, I would want to start with you. <coughs> Indeed, I think every year we have th these conversations you know, about the, uh, sa the safety on our roads, the increase in speed of accidents, fatalities on the roads and all of that. And so when we come back to the table again to talk about it in a new year, it's quite worrying. You would expect that um, we would be you know, making some inroads in terms of how we are you know, dealing with road safety issues. We do know that the government has put in place a number of, um, if you like, measures to help with these situations. Indeed, there's the 2018 action plan to address um, road safety on our roads and all. But I think to start this conversation, if you could just you know, let us know, specifically with the Dompoasi Junction, um, is it the Dompoasi Road accident? Yes, which occurred on Tuesday. We're looking at fatalities of about 34, is that the case? Oh, if you could bring us up to speed with the, with the figures. All right, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. And let me also associate myself with the, your opening comments that uh, we also uh, sympathizing with the bereaved uh, families <coughs> of the 35 mm. uh, victims in these crashes. And the same extends to about 2,284 compatriots we lost uh, in crashes last year. The family, we are with them. Same to those who are nursing injury as right. a result of these preventable crashes. We pray for speedy recovery mm -hmm. so that we all join hands to sustain the nation building spirit. Uh, having said that, on Tuesday, dawn, this unfortunate preventable crash mm -hmm. on the one of our trans West African highway that traverses uh, the, the, along the Gulf uh, of Guinea in Ghana, from uh, Elubo to Afla, and in particular uh, between uh, Commander and Takrade. Specifically, the Lado Pass stretch, uh, we had uh, this unfortunate crash at dawn. Mm. Uh, and in the process, we uh, registered a lot of fatalities and injured persons. Uh, among the injured, were, among the, uh, the dead, we had uh, 21 males and uh, 11 females, and then uh, three. Uh, babies, it's making 35, right. and uh, it's 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 the reason why we have gathered once again to continue from <laughs> where we left off last year, yeah. where on that same stretch we lost so many at the Kumfi, mm -hmm. and on that same day we lost so many on the N10 uh, between Techiman and then Kentampo, yeah. uh, totaling about 65 deaths. <laughs> In one crash, with about 30 of them getting charred or bent. And it is a, a recurring road safety problem, uh, which the state have rolled out a lot of strategies since 1991 with the view of cuterizing this kanka uh, river. It's because we are human. These challenges are having a toll on us. And um, it's the reason why I believe this morning we have gathered here to share ideas and to know where the gaps are. Right. and to sensitize ourselves sure. and to move on. Sure. Quickly, if I move to the other panelists, you, you do say that um, over the years there's been attempts to you know, put in place measures to deal with this issue. Would you say in your estimation that we've been able to have 
the benefit of these plans to you know curb the incidence of road carnage or there's been no you know corresponding impact how would you assess it in a do nothing situation it would have been worse sure. and we, given our history as a state way back in 1952 when we made the effort of coming up with a rule law that has established protocol of uh, road safety agencies and institution of MTT, the National Road Safety Authority, and then the transport operators and driver and vehicle licenses authority, and the calls and road agencies, among others, are in here to support. Mm -hmm. We have gone far. Having said that, there are certain specifics that we have been doing, which is giving hope mm -hmm. in recent time. For example, in 2010, when the UN promulgated the idea of bringing road safety matters to the front burner. Right. Ghana have partnered and have got one of the best road policy, the decade of action for road safety, of which the pillars are being implemented vigorously. And I'm not surprised that the, the NRSC is now NRSC, for example, that we have the motor traffic and transport becoming a department instead of a unit, and we have a lot of interventions that are coming under the pillars. In that respect, we have done well. I'm surprised. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that in record time, uh, DVLA, for example, is gravitating towards automating the National Vehicle Register and the Driver License Register, for example, with the view of ensuring that we have. We have automation of uh, traffic enforcement. Mm. These are matters that we've done. Again, we know that it also comes with investment, mm -hmm. and that is why I believe uh, uh, the minister uh, last yesterday assured the state that what the state intends doing under the strategy of ensuring that we have safer roads and mobility, it will ensure that this transnational highway, where uh, which we are supposed to dualize, we have not been able to do it, and, and such section that is not been able to do dualize, that's where these uh, fatal crashes are occurring. Over time, it's going to be done. And I think it is a resulting out of this policy among others. So for me, it is not all that a bad situation, at the but it also tells us that we have just begun, and we need to have we need to have hands on deck and to be focused and to ensure that the countermeasures that are coming out of the policy drawn out are implemented over time and with that time we'll be able to achieve uh, right I, I mean in, in several discussions you know it, it always comes out that this dealing with this situation is a multifaceted one and so you'd have to you know look at various sides of it but predominantly you're looking at um, factors such as the road the driver and the vehicle. These three usually are the main, you know, issues at play when we're looking at road, road traffic issues or road safety matters. I would want to know from you, Robert, coming from the um, National Road Safety Authority, in, what has been the authority's assessment of these, you know, factors that cause or that bring about these um, incidents on the road, which is the leading cause? if there's anything like a leading cause amongst the three. And f if any, what has been the attempt to deal with that particular factor, which is leading to a lot of fatalities on our roads? So you're looking at road, you're looking at the individual, i.e. The, 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 the driver, and the vehicle, as in the, the, um, the, 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 the condition of the vehicle on the roads. Um, okay, thank you very much. And um, the authority would also like to send um, to the victims of this accident also wish the people who are at the hospital SPD recovery. Mm. Um, yes, the factors, the factors that causes road accidents, the, you mentioned the three factors, that is the vehicle, the road, and then the individual. Mm -hmm. When the vehicle is alone, it can't cause an accident. When you do not use the road, you know, but when these three factors come together, then there's a conflict, and if not, it, it's not managed well, mm. then an accident can happen. Um, studies show that, uh, in, especially in Ghana, the highest factor is the human factor. Mm. About 90% of crashes that happen in Ghana is as a result of the human factor. And what is being done about it? You know, pre previously, when it comes to this, uh, we call it uh, the, we call it the road safety space. When um, these come together within these conflicts, there should be safety measures. So that road safety space 
in um, was a little there was a vacuum but now with the coming in of the national road safety authority from the commission this vacuum has been filled mm. the authority has come to fill this vacuum and um, you know the law was passed last year the regulations are being put in place to um, the return insurance is being place, uh, put in place to actualize the act. So when that is done, then we'll see the full implementation of the new act. Mm. So that's one major step that has been taken. You know, you were talking, he was talking about the pillars, and this one of the main pillars, uh, the road safety management. When you look at road safety management, that's one of the main issues that we have been able to get. Okay, so when you talk about road safety management, what, what, what does that entail? It means that as a country, how is your road safety being managed? You have a lead organization. Which yeah, is in this which case, is in would this that case be the NRSA? National Road Safety okay. Authority. And then also, does the, do they have the full um, functions? Do they have functions to be able to tackle road safety management within the country? Which I would say yes, we're in coming of course of the, um, the NRSA Act. 93 of 2019, yes, now we have been able to fill that vacuum. But beyond the act, the act may be there, yes, yes. but you, you definitely need something more or things more than the act. Yes. Do you have that? I, I, I believe yeah. that is a question. Do you have those, the resources to enable you to perform your duties as provided by the act? Um, the act in coming into force also looked at all these the giving resources to the authority mm -hmm. so that the authority will be able to work. So if you look in the act, it has, it has now um, sources of funding for the, um, for the authority to be able to implement oh. its um, activities and also its mandate, achieve its mandate. Mm. So yes, if, if you look at the act, all these have been provided in it. Right, in the, um, because I, I'm asking this question because I, I've, I've seen reports where the, um, you know, the, the authority is, is complaining about the funds that have been allocated and saying that it's inadequate. That, that, and so that, that, that was the commission. The commission used mm -hmm. to say inadequate funding a lot. But, but the authority it's coming says... To, uh, to force of the authority, mm -hmm. and I say, if we, the act is <coughs> actualized, then mm -hmm. you realize that now fund the resources for the authority shouldn't be a problem. So what are the sources and of funding beyond the common fund? You're on the consolidated fund, obviously, or, and then the road fund? Yes, the uh -huh. road fund. Then at now we've been also been giving the power to internally generate funds. Right. Then we also have funding coming from the insurance industry. Mm. Then from the driver and vehicle regis uh, testing and registration. Mm. So when these funds come in, we think that we will be in a position to be able to um, uh, do a lot of our activities that hitherto we couldn't. Very well. Well, we, we will be digging deeper into, you know, the, um, 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 the functions of the National Road Safety Authority and see how things are panning out after the act was, you know, um, and the act was promulgated. And as you do say, your regulations are being put together to enable you give effect to, to the act. But obviously, in the absence of the regulations, some work, nonetheless, yes, can, some, can work, yeah, some work is being done. Can, can, can continue. Now, let me turn to the GPRT. Now, of the three factors that, you know, cause or lead to road um, accidents, we are hearing from the NRSA that the human element is, 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 is the highest, according to studies. Now, coming from the GPRT, obviously, you're working with the driver community. What, 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 what is the GPRTU's take on these you know, matters? And what is it that the GPRTU is doing to help deal with the situation? Because obviously, this is one that involves the GPRTU. Well, thank you. The GPRT also sympathizes with uh, the bereaved families. Unfortunately, both vehicles are, you know, coming from the same station. Mm. They are members of the GPRT. So it's hardly a sad situation. Mm. Yes, I agree with, you know, uh, the National Road Safety Authority, you know, personnel over here. That uh, the major factor of road accident that we, we witnessed you know, within this country are mostly uh, human error. About 70% of you know, road accidents are as a result of <coughs> human error. So, therefore, it means if we become a little bit uh, you know, careful, we can override. These unfortunate uh, situations. 
I believe, you know, fatigue may have caused, may have been part of this, uh, you know, accident. Because uh, during the Christmas, you know, festivities, most of the drivers never rested because of the influx of uh, passengers at the various stations. Immediately they arrive, then at the, uh, the next destination, they embark on another journey. But according to road traffic regulation section 118, it has been stated that you should, at least when you drive for four hours, you should mandatory rest for 30 minutes. I wonder whether, you know, during the Christmas they comply with this simple directive, you know, as in the road traffic regulations. So, you know, they were tired right from December before they entered into this uh, uh, January. And another factor is the overspeeding on the part of the drivers. I don't believe that any driver, you know, worth its salt, would speed and wouldn't know that it's overspeeding. You see, sometimes uh, they, they say, they say, you know, this driver loaded some 15 minutes before I did. Let me go and overtake him so mm -hmm. that at the next uh, uh, destination, I'll be able to load my vehicles, uh, my vehicle before him. All these things are something that, you know, must be nipped in the bud. After all, when you rush, probably you, you will not end very well. We've been educating them. We've been being assisted by, you know, personnel from MTT, the, you know, receptive authority at our various uh, meetings in our various regions and branches. But uh, it's difficult that some of them will not listen to simple instructions from these personnel. Uh, well, in every home we have mensa, and we must be able to fish out these mensas if there is any sanction per, you know, the rule. You know, those sanctions must be meted out to those people. What are the crimes or? What were the crimes of those who are dead now? They are only trying to exercise their freedom of movement as pertain in the constitution of Ghana by using part of their movement, by using uh, uh, transport. transport. And all of a sudden, you know, we end up their lives in such a manner. Some of them are breadwinners. You know, what would you know, uh, those who depend on them will do. Then it's, it means we are visiting hardship on a larger number of people who know to us. I will appeal that uh, the education must still go on. The drivers must be cautious that, you know, we will not see things of this nature again. Very well. Yeah. Very well. Now let me go to you, uh, Mrs. Atto. Coming from the DVLA, clearly then, DVLA has responsibility for two of the three factors we've identified yep. as the leading as a, as a causes of you know, road accidents, talking about the driver and then the vehicle. So you have the responsibility of you know, licensing the driver and then the vehicle. Now, I think people, the, the, over the years, people have had concerns about the kind of cars, for instance, we see on the roads. I mean, you don't need to... Um, be, uh, I don't know what kind of specialist it is to, to, to say that, well, this car obviously is not fit to be on the road. We see all, 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 all sorts of cars on the road raising serious questions about the kind of, you know, processes we go through at GVLA. So as an authority with, two, with responsibility for two of these elements of the three here, what would be your, you know, estimation or assessment of how these, these things have, you know, manifested in, in, in the lives of, 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 the, of, of the country to the extent that how, to the extent that you can say that, well, you've performed a certain function, that, or you've performed a certain function, 
which essentially would, you know, curb the incidents of, you know, road, road transport accidents. Because obviously, the driver is key, the vehicle is also key. If you have a very dysfunctional car being driven by a super competent driver, chances of, you know, there being some, you know, mi mishaps on the road are high. The reverse is also true. A, a very good car on the road, but a very incompetent driver, very negligent or careless driver on the road, these things could also happen. So in terms of licensing drivers, licensing vehicles, what kinds of measures are in place to ensure that we get the best of the situation? All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me say a very good morning to our cherished viewers and to also um, on behalf of um, the board management of DVLA, once again, as we have done um, recently, extend our condolences to the families of the bereaved and uh, those who are still recovering. We wish them um, some speedy recovery. We understand that our partners in the health sector are attending to um, those needing medical care, and um, we stand um, to support the efforts that have been made to ensure that um, they receive the best care and uh, they recover and return to their normal um, lifestyles um, quickly. Um, having said that, I think um, it's true that the DVLA plays a critical role when it comes to road safety management and um, um, promotion in this country. Fundamentally so because um, the vehicles plying on our roads are registered by the DVLA, the drivers uh, moving these vehicles uh, to be trained and licensed by the DVLA. And so it will be important for me to um, look at what has been um, the situation um, over the past few years, what we are still doing to ensure that the road, we contribute significantly as we've done in the past um, to promoting road safety in the country. If you look at the driver side, um, as my colleagues have mentioned, training has been um, an area that the authority has focused on significantly. Um, recently, we had to review our test bank to understand um, what the situation is, particularly with some of our friends in the transport unions. Um, I'm happy that our senior brother from GPRTU is here. Um, you, you know, licensing itself, uh, previously, uh, there were a lot of our friends and brothers out there who shy and from undertaking the, um, the uh, uh, computer-based test because they think that the, the test is skewed um, in the English language to their disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So recently the authority undertook a major overhaul and we are translating the test bank into six major Ghanaian languages. And so you come in and you can take the exam at the language of your choice, the language that you are more comfortable with. Your inability to speak English language should not be a disadvantage or disqualifying factor for you to be able to drive effectively in this country. And so this is one area that we've looked at. Beyond the training, we've also looked at the, the testing itself, the, how we examine um, drivers across the country and licensing them and to ensure that we do not have incidences where people have an, um, invalid licenses. Uh, across the country and so we are on our own translating power, transmitting power to the citizens, to the police. We have systems that we co share with our partners with the police to ensure that at any given point in time it's easier, more convenient and effective to test, to, to, to verify the license that a driver is holding mm. at any given point in time to ensure that that driver is indeed qualified to drive the type of vehicle that he or she but is you know, driving. Sorry to cut you, yes. there, there's, there's been this issue about, you know, th that middleman, if you like, called mm -hmm. the Goro Boys, mm -hmm. who would have their own ways and means to procure um, um, the licenses for drivers. Clearly, drivers who have had no interaction whatsoever with the authority would have licenses and be driving on the roads, mm -hmm. which is obviously an issue. We do know that you've in the past in indicated that you have you know, this, I mean, you've done away, or the system has been made more robust improved, to the yeah. extent that yeah. that element or that, you know, intermediary, you know, space, if you like, of the Goro Boys is no more there. But we do know that they still 
uh, are there doing what they do? So what exactly is being done about that? Because once the person has not been tested by the DVLA, but has a license, that is, I mean, a very, diff a very dangerous uh, situation we have on our hands then. Because they would produce a valid license to the police if they are stopped on the, on, the, on the road, but then they don't have the competence to be behind the wheel. So, so that's why if you haven't gone through the DVLA system, whatever you produce is not a driver's license. It may look like a driver's license, but because the system did not produce that, you, s you haven't been certified and authorized. So you're saying the robots are able to produce their own licenses? So, so that is why technology in our in operations has done a lot of good, the introduction of um, effect efficient technology in what we do. So it, is, it, it has become extremely difficult. For, extremely for difficult, example. but not impossible. So there are chances, there are, there are situations where the Gold Boys can actually get. You know, I, I think we should look at it from the perspective of what the situation was mm -hmm. and what it is right now. You're making improvements. So Significant improvements. Yes, no, so, so because the, I, I'm not sure that there's any system where it is foolproof. And in, in our country, if you look at what we have right now, mm then we can score, if we're scoring foolproof systems, we can uh, give that. Having said, I think it's important we also look at commercial operations in this country. And the, the, the best place of that is wh when the vehicles even are imported into the country. So right from the port, the, the, the nature of the vehicles that are imported for commercial vehicle operations in this country. So. Right from the port, the vehicle comes in, it's, it's been mm. cleared as a goods vehicle, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. The next thing we, we, we see at DVLA is these vehicles are coming in for conversion into commercial mm -hmm. um, um, vehicles. And so um, it's important that we look at that space as well. So but then when they bring in yes. those cars, you have the power Exactly. To refuse to register them, don't exactly. you? Exactly. So and then we see some of these cars on the road. So provisions are in the airline to guide how you convert some of these vehicles mm. um, into commercial use. For example, uh, what we all call the Sprinter bus, etc. Some of these come in um, purposely for you know goods. Unfortunately, because we do not have a very robust uh, you know public urban transport system, some of these things have a key role to play. Mm. And in doing that, we have to also ensure that they adhere to road rules and regulations. Mm. So the conversion process, if, if you come to DVLA right now, we have partnered with our brothers with uh, at DPRTU, DPRTU mm. and to ensure that we clean up that particular space. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's extremely difficult for you to bring in a vehicle, get authorization for the conversion, and then go and do the wrong thing and think that you will get certification mm. to move that vehicle around for commercial purposes. And again, when you look at our roadworthy systems right now, initially where the system was mechanized, you know, you, you can just walk in there, someone will physically look at the vehicle and then use a the leg probably to kick around and say, okay, this vehicle it's is safe. And mm. Exactly. Currently, it is not so. There is no system like that anymore. You have to subject the vehicle to a computer-based test the, ve the, the, the vehicle is examined, and if the vehicle fails any of those parameters, including brakes, steering, your headlamps, etc., the vehicle will not be issued a roadworthy certificate. Mm. That is a significant step that we have taken to clean up the road environment because there are a lot of vehicles, irrespective of the brand, the module, the nature of the vehicle, any of these faults could develop at any given time. And the inability of the state acting through the DVLA to detect these is a serious problem. And so what we have done is open up and inject significant cutting edge technology into the inspection and the certification of vehicles in the roadworthy space. Okay. And so currently, okay. if the, the police have gadgets, mm -hmm. for example, to be able to, <coughs> on the go, inspect the vehicle, for example, the roadworthy certificate, to be sure that this roadworthy certificate wasn't produced somewhere else. That is one aspect of it. The improvement in the certificate itself makes it difficult for you to just walk behind the, 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 the kiosk and get someone produce a fake roadworthy certificate for you. And so if you look at that particular space, that is an important improvement. In addition to that, we have started last year discussions with our partners again, National Road Safety Commission, the uh, authority now, 
um, MTTD, the um, GPRTU, mm -hmm. and the rest, to look at um, implementing the provisions in the LI2180 relating to speed limiters, where commercial vehicles must have speed limiters installed in them before they operate in, in, in the road space. We are having a lot of consultations ongoing to ensure that the, the way and the structure that we put in to ensure compliance with these regulations are not in a way that is deterrent to uh, or discouraging voluntary compliance, not necessarily waiting for people to enforce the road mm. rules and regulations. So the, the authority is doing a lot in this area to ensure that uh, we contribute significantly to road safety in Ghana. Very well. We're looking at uh, road accidents in the country and we've had a high rate of road accidents over the years. In fact, there are statistics that will be pulling up shortly to indicate the fatalities that have occurred over the period. And um, in, I believe I, I looked up uh, this information on the National Road Safety Authority website and it indicated that, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, that I'm about 13,877 crashes in 2019, uh, involving some 22,789 vehicles with 2,284 fatalities and 14,397 injuries. And this is from the National uh, Road Safety Authority website. Indeed, these figures are staggering. Uh, what can be done about it? Around the table this morning are uh, the stakeholders in the sector, you're talking about the police, particularly the MTTD, you're looking at the National Road Safety Authority, which is to be spearheading the road safety management issues in the country. And of course, there's the GPRTU and there is the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority. So indeed, all, all the relevant stakeholders are present around the table. So indeed, we're having uh, an insightful conversation this morning, which we, we hope would have far-reaching um, 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 impact or benefits. Superintendent, I'll come back to you. Mr. Zato in his submissions talked about what the DVLA is doing, talked about automation and all those you know, beautiful um, ideas or measures that have been put in place in there. He talked about you know, the process of certifying vehicles as you know, fit for the roads. Now, I'm looking at the... the, 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 the stage where the vehicle, after having been certified, now goes onto the road. Obviously, the DVLA would not be present on the road all throughout the time that the vehicle will be plying the roads to ensure that, yes, after certification, you're still within, you know, that which led us to certify the vehicle as fit for the road. Obviously, that falls within the domain of the MTTD to ensure that, yes, your, your, your um, highlights or your the lights are functioning well. You don't have one light off, one light just working, and all those things. Your brakes are functioning well. Your side mirrors are all in place. Everything is working well. He talks also about the fact that there's this, um, you know, measure put in place to ensure that the police have the requisite equipment to detect that, you know, the um, <coughs> the the what's that? that the stickers, right? The, the roadworthy stickers are authentic and not one that has been procured by you know, from any um, 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 guru boy or any entity that shouldn't be issuing those statements. How well resourced is the police to, to deal with this issue, deal with this aspect of the equation? Because if you ask me, it's a value chain, and the, 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 the actors are all playing their roles. I think so far we've been doing really well. If you're we doing tremendously well, then we shouldn't be seeing certain the cars on the we roads, we the on, uh, the superintendent. Of, with the kind of uh, road safety management we have on our hands, because we realize that it is recently that we, the state intends to automate okay. the traffic enforcement and management in the country uh, to you know, move away from the 1952 to now. Uh, I think it's a long time. So yeah, that, 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 that has been yeah. our lots, and that's why we are gradually moving away. And I talked about it earlier. Uh, the other uh, issue I want to talk about is if you look at, for example, uh, the kind of work we do uh, within 
the, the stakeholders in, gathered here, including the DBLA. We, we, we are kind of uh, uh, fail a gap because we have a responsibility to ensure that only certified or permitted vehicles that are coming to the country permanently are uh, registered on our national vehicle register and tested and given permit to also be used on our roads and upon the registration and licensing and assurance that they are roadworthy, they are deployed on the road through the owners of this vehicle. And some are permitted for a year for private vehicle owners and commercial drivers and, and their owners are permitted for a six-month period. And within that period where they are supposed to be on the road, it's our responsibility mm -hmm. and the vehicle owner and the driver to ensure that the standards that are set and certified to ensure that the vehicle does not pose danger to public health and safety are adhered to. And that's why when you look at the data, for example, uh, between January 1st and 31st of December last year, for example, you look at that, I can say that drivers that deployed and vehicle never deployed about 741 vehicles on our road that were not fit that had physical defects, that had uh, procured uh, what they call, procured uh, uh, documents that otherwise were uh, different from what DVLA issues yeah. were arrested, for example. And drivers that were driving vehicles with defective tires, uh, numbers were about 294, were arrested and were put before the court. And that tells you clearly of the kind of work we do. Yeah. Again, obviously, uh, you're doing some work, but I just want us to know you're looking at a police service of a certain size as against. I know, I know, I so, are you, do, are you even in terms of numbers, do we have you, you don't, know you don't the, 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 the right proportion? In terms of policing, you normally don't necessarily need a huge number. It's obviously, normally, when you have uh, equipment and the technology and you have for example and that's why it, uh, in april 2008 the state has now commissioned us to automate our system yes it says Obviously, here i have yes, that it says enforcement yes, of road traffic the essence, the police is, the essence is very fines by yes. automation of mttd yeah. operations this was in 2018 question is two years down the lane do what, we have this in place that it is a, a project that needs to be built and architecture and deployed. And so is it in place? Yes, right? it's ongoing. So you have the spot fines. You, you, you have that it's ongoing. Has it been? Has it started? We are yet to so deploy the first camera and okay. the first caution notice because you need to build a system Definitely. and deploy, test it, and let the public know what you intend to do, and then let all stakeholders buy in. Because when you look in the law, section one one eight, in two thousand and four, that was the vision of Ghana. And in 2012, we came up with implementation plan in Regulation 157. And that is why this is pivoted on, to ensure that eventually we have an, a system that is robust, built to the taste of Ghanaians, based on culture and all that. Mm. And that alone will ensure that we deploy optimally. Having said that, you observe that the equipment that we require as at now, in terms of the kind of policing we do, mm -hmm. uh, with us. We need to have the numbers, mm. we have trained them. We have the equipment when you are talking about speeding, because speeding accounts for a lot of fatalities. So, so we have handheld one, both cameras. Inadequate and numbers. We have a yes. So you're, 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 you're saying you so have them, so, they're so good. So far as equipment for speeding, so far as equipment for ensuring that safer vehicles are deployed in terms of three-dimensional barcode scanner. We have adequate numbers from DVLA. We have adequate number of speed equipment from uh, DVLA uh, that we, uh, and Route 1, we must credit them for that. And we have a lot of equipment in terms of alcohol sensors mm -hmm. that helps us to ensure that those who are driving destructive because they are on alcohol, are detected in real time and, and put before court. So most of this we have an uh, adequate number of traffic police officers who have been trained and equipped and deployed because our deployment is not also haphazard. Yeah. It is data-led. And so sometimes 
you think that you don't have, you have the numbers. What is required is what April uh, 2018 talked about, that in all this, it should not be a physical enforcement, but a, a deep enforcement well. that is based on technology. Well. So that a back office, as is done elsewhere in other jurisdictions, yes. will support the traffic police officer okay. so that we can, the drivers mm -hmm. and their vehicle owners will be forthcoming in real time when they are involved in moving violations. Very well, thank you. Let me move to um, <coughs> Rob, um, sorry, um, Henry here. And when um, 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 Abraham was making his submissions, he talked about the conversion process, and I, 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 that struck me because I'm looking at a situation where cars are brought in or vehicles are brought in for a certain purpose, and then they are converted into a certain type of vehicle for, you know, moving people around obviously raising issues about the safety of these kinds of vehicles. He talked about the fact that, yes, it is to be done in accordance with certain standards set. But my question is, as coming from National Road Safety Authority, do you have concerns with this kind of provision in the regulations, that cars or vehicles can be converted from, you know, say, vehicles that are meant for goods can be, you know, converted to vehicles for passengers? And I'm asking this question because we do know that the particular type of cars he talked about, for instance, the Sprinter, um, as a Benz buses, are converted into passenger cars. And they are defective to the extent that they don't have basic provisions such as seat belts. And we do know that seat belts play a major role in road safety issues. So from the N um, National Road Safety Authority's perspective, what do you make of this? provision in the regulations about conversion of vehicles. Yeah, well, thank you very much. The conversion of vehicles, um, the DVLA, as AB said, has standards that you would need to meet. And these standards include the ins installation of seatbelts. But I have, I'm when, yet to see um, any sprinter car that has a seatbelt, aside maybe the, the driver's seatbelt. Um, oh, you, there are instances where the passengers have seatbelts. I, I was going to build a point on that. Okay. So. Um, this uh, installation of seat belts, you know, when you look at the regulations, it also says that every um, passenger carrying vehicle should have <laughs> seat belts for all passengers. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are implementing that regulation, and one thing that has come up, especially from the transport organizations, was that okay, let's start with the intercity buses, those who travel long distances across cities. And that is something that has come up, and we intend to ensure that all vehicles that travel across cities have seat belts in them. The DVLA has gone a step further by looking at some of the uh, seat belts that can be installed in these vehicles. And AB can attest to the fact that yes, they have gone through all that process and we are at the latter stages where these seat belts will be installed in this. As for the conversion of the vehicles, for now the law allows it. Really if I'm asking, is it, do you think it should still remain in there? Because laws are if, not if, cast if in stone. They can be amended. But do if you these think conversions are done in accordance with the standards but set they are by not the done, DVLA. Are they? No, they are. Because um, the DVLA, before they can issue you the roadworthiness, would ensure that the conversions are done in accordance with their standards. And which is why I was saying then that also these printer vehicles, do they have seat belts? Most of them don't. Yet they have been certified by the DVLA. Don't you find that problematic? Yes, and I, as I explained, we are doing that to get them to install these seat belts. In the GPRTU, would attest to that fact that we've been engaging them on this situation, and we are at the latter stages where all these intercity buses would have seat belts on them. Mm. So the intercity buses should have. What about the intra-cities? Because we accidents started, do happen you know, in intra-cities as well. We started from the intercity, mm -hmm. then we will come to it. It doesn't mean that the intra-city would not have, but we are uh, running it in phases. In phases, okay. GPR to you, you have had prob trouble or problems with this, you know, the need to enforce uh, the rule, if you like, to have seatbelts in there. Because uh, the reason why I'm going big on this issue about seatbelts, obviously, you know, it can reduce the number of fatalities because you have accidents okay and then people are thrown out of the window and all but if there are seat belts present definitely we could you know ensure that or we, we, we could record less fatalities in some instances so what is it about this rule that you um gprt you find a challenge with <coughs> i agree with uh, you know, the national road safety authority person 
uh, when this uh, issue, they were trying to uh, come up with this very issue, when they were trying to implement mm -hmm. that section of, of the rule, yes. uh, we came out, you know, falsely to oppose, yeah, you know, because uh, we felt we were being driven out of, you know, our livelihood, our jobs, w looking at the vehicles that we use. You see, it is not our making. We don't cherish using rickety vehicles, but conditions, you know. Sometimes so we are compromising then our, our, our safety, uh, wouldn't you say oh, so? No, that is not so. You know, imagine you pick a vehicle from uh, Choco. You are only coming to a, a place like post office. You know, uh, what kind of accidents will occur oh. so much <laughs> that, uh, you know, really? people will lose their... So no, it's, it's only a walking distance. When you but so far as the car is your making contact with second. the road and there's a driver, we've established here that these three elements are what you know lead but, to. But with carefulness, from Choco to uh, uh, Salaga, I don't think I don't see how a driver can overspeed at that point to. Mr. Zatu is Nassau. smiling. I'm sure he is. He has um, his contrary <laughs> views. Yes, and uh, and and also, you see, we were agitating for you know the intercity. And most of the intercity vehicles that we use are fitted with, uh, you know, seat beds because, you know, at the moment they were imported from uh, outside the country, the seat beds are already Exactly. Fitted. So that doesn't come under the conversion argument. Yes. The conversion yes. argument is the one that we are talking about now because the elements of seat belts are missing. It's missing, which is a worrying concern. The, the, the conversion part is mainly on the side of the intercity, the trotters that we use. You see, uh, the conditions of the trotter that we use over here, I, I mean the uh, government is being considerate, uh, MTTD, they are being considerate, like almost all the vehicles will be out of the road. And uh, when all these vehicles are out of the road, uh, at, at, at least uh, we must make a living. Again, that, that is where we're going. Like, yes. I, as I was saying behind the scenes earlier on, we are allowing poverty to dictate to us. And I think that is very disturbing as a people. To say that, well, because certain conditions, you know, of, we need to make a living, let's compromise on our security, our safety and all of that. I, I think that is quite well, problematic. Well, in, in this circumstance, uh, we... we we should appeal to the government mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, you know uh, government uh, assistance with you know mm. buses so that uh, we can use for these trotters. Mm. Do government do assist, but mainly those that we use for the intra city, and not mm. that of the trotters. Very well. We we need, we need to bring this conversation to an end. So I will just you know give a minute each for you know, uh, wrapping up um, um, Abraham quickly on, on, on... Yeah, thank you very much. Um, once again, on behalf of um, DVLA, I would like to ensure um, all Ghanaians that the authority is, is active um, in, in ensuring that the vehicles plying our roads, the drivers driving these vehicles are properly, properly licensed, trained and certified to undertake whatever venture that they have to undertake. And we stand solidly behind um, um, the state's efforts at yeah. promoting road safety. And we will do everything and continue to do everything and within our mandate to ensure that um, the necessary um, equipment are provided to our staff and to our collaborators mm -hmm. yeah. um, in promoting road safety in this country. Yeah, well, thank you, Henry. Your concluding remarks. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I would want to tell everybody that the <coughs> National Road Safety Authority has come to stay and that we would ensure within our mandate that the roads are safe for all to use and that all stakeholders within the road safety management framework mm -hmm. apply the standards as they should be applied. Very well. And Mr. Sabah, yes. Oh, I will appeal to you know, our drivers to comply with road traffic regulations. When these things are done, you know, the, the road accidents on our road you know, will be minimized, mm. if not entirely eliminated. Kept totally. Very well. Superintendent, you have the, the right. last word. 
concluding by taking some last year, for example, and I'm making appeal to road users that last year, after DVLA, after we have also been sensitized by the National Road Safety Authority, and upon departure from the Laurel Park, the, our attitude impacted negatively, mm. said that we lost 2,284 Guineans. Some were pedestrians, some were motorcycle occupants or passengers or pillar riders. Some were commercial vehicle occupants, and some were private vehicle occupants or passengers. And most of these were as a result of our own behavior. And therefore, I appeal to Ghanaians that we should be responsible as vehicle owners in terms of how we use the road and how we take care of our car. We should hand over same to responsible drivers. And when you are given the vehicle, as a certified driver by DPA, please comply with Road Traffic Act 663 of 2004 and Road Traffic Regulation LI 2020 of 2012. And as vehicle occupant passenger, please let us learn to wear seatbelts, sa habit, and let us be decorous if they are in place today. in the first place. If it is. <laughs> the and seatbelts are present. And <laughs> when we are light as pedestrians, mm -hmm. passengers, please let us make sure that we walk on the left and don't allow vehicle to come from the right. And then we cross the road at safe crossing points, i.e. zebra crossing, pelican crossing, wait for the light to come on. And then when the fourth bridges and let's are suspended, use the foot bridges, let us exactly. go up and forth. Sure. Let's With this, we believe that crisis will go down. But appeal to drivers, please, don't let us, don't let allow ourselves to be trailed by speed. And don't let, don't let us change lane anyhow, particularly on intercity yeah. city, uh, oil Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you so much. You heard from our um, competent panelists this morning, Superintendent Alex Obing. He's the director of the education research and training with the MTTD of the Ghana Police Service. Also, you heard um, Henry Asumini. He's the, na the National Road Safety Authority. Robert Saba is the vice chairman of the Ghana Private Road Transport um, Union GPR to you, and last but not least, Abraham Zato. He's the Deputy Director, Research, Business Development and Innovation with the Driver and Vehicle License and Authority, DVLA. So next up, we are going to continue with the conversation, the raging conversation, let me put it that way, over the EC's decision to acquire a new um, biometric voter management system. Now this week, a coalition of 18 civil society organizations uh, waded into this debate. They issued a statement, raised a number of issues, analyzed them and put out their conclusions and recommendations. We shall be looking at this statement into some detail. And of course, we will try to understand what informed this position of theirs. But also, uh, in the week, the um, eminent committee, advisory committee that the EC put together not too long ago, um, called for calm by the various political parties as this matter is still being interrogated or debated. We will <coughs> take some um, pictures or videos from the uh, CSO press conference as well as the EC. But before then, let me quickly introduce that panel to help us with this conversation. For my extreme left, we have Mr. Obi Amwa, he is the Honourable Member of Parliament for Ikrapim South Constituency and he is also the Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development. Next is Osei Kwame Griffiths, he is the Director of IT with the National Democratic Congress NDC. And to my right we have George Osei Dimpe, he is with the Send Ghana Executive Director, I believe. Country Director. Country Director, sorry, forgive me. And uh, last but not least is Jonathan Asante Ochoa. He is a senior lecturer with the University of Cape Coast and a political analyst. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to have you here and welcome Thank to the so show. Much. And <coughs> even before we came on, we had a spirited conversation. So it's going to be <laughs> an interesting one, I can assure you. But before that, like I said, we'll take um, uh, a recap of some aspects of the press conference by the 18 CSOs, and then also hear from the Electoral Commission. So let's take a listen to these. 
The controversy over the need or otherwise for a new voter's register rages on, even after the Electoral Commission's advisory council's request to the EC to further engage stakeholders. The issue has torn the political front further apart. On one side is the NDC and its opposing allies, and the other, the ruling NPP and its 13 political allies endorsing the Electoral Commission's position. The Electoral Commission has already secured its 400 million city budgetary allocation for the exercise, insisting that the register is bloated and the biometric verification device obsolete. But the coalition disagrees. We and our IT experts have thoroughly examined the Electoral Commission submissions and found them, unfortunately, quite defective and unconvincing. One issue is whether Ghana needs a completely new biometric voter management system, BVMS, an end-to-end -end infrastructure comprising hardware, software, data centers, databases, and fresh mass enrollment of voters. The coalition contends that the EC has not been able to demonstrate that the biometric data is not good enough for the December 7 polls. We believe that the EC has not demonstrated that there is a defect with the biometric data which was used as recently as two months ago on a nationwide scale to necessitate the spending of $70 million on mass registration. It has already conducted limited registration for the district elections and should be using that benchmark cost for the general elections limited registration. If the EC wishes to acquire new BVRs and BVDs, and so far, it has said little to justify why it needs to do so. It is the position of the coalition that the facial recognition feature the EC intends to introduce to verify voters is a backward technology. They further argued that even though the constitution in Article 45 mandates the EC to compile a voter's register, it does not mean it should be new. The law uses the word compile. This does not suggest that the EC must always create a totally new system. Indeed, the law envisages a situation where the information exists in various forms or even at various places and requires the EC not to recreate the information but rather to compile the data. A compilation clearly means the EC must collate it from existing sources. Incidentally and fortunately, there exists a national institution set up and empowered by law to collect such information for the purpose of national identification and related uses. The coalition wants the EC to collaborate with the National Identification Authority to use its logistics to collect data which may be required to update the current voters register. Meanwhile, some of the CSOs have been engaging the EC on the way forward. If everything sets to roll out, what are the timelines the Electoral Commission is looking at starting the registration process? So um, what we can say with the timelines is that this is not the first time that the Electoral Commission is undertaking registration or compilation of a register in an election year. In 2012, we compiled a new voters register. And then in 2016, we also did a limited voter registration exercise, all in the election year. Per the calendar of the commission or the program of activities, the current registration is slated for April. Prior to that, the commission will undertake recruitment of our officials. Definitely, we also have the biometric exercise uh, equipment that will be used for the registration. So we have to take delivery of the equipment, do some pilot testing, and then find out whether they are very good as we have anticipated, you know, uh, looking at the criteria and all that. Definitely there should be some pilot testing and all that. All these things will be done. So per the calendar of the commission, we will start the registration in April. But prior to that, there will be recruitment, there will be training, there will be deployment of materials, 
and, uh, and testing of the equipment and, also. And, and, and if we are starting in April, what period, is it a one month exercise, two month exercise, or we are very likely to probably even do the entire country in a few weeks? What the commission has prepared is this. We are going to use what we call the cluster system. What it means is that the registration is going to be done at every polling station. When we say the cluster, we are going to merge four polling stations and assign one biometric verification kit, the registration kit to it. So the commission will use a period of 10 days for each polling station. So the first police station will spend 10 days, then they move to the second police station, it will spend 10 days, and then the third, and then the fourth. Mm. So with equipment of 8,000, and with um, a police station of uh, 30, let's make it about 32,000, mm. conveniently, within 40 days, the 8,000 equipment will cover all the 32,000 police stations. And we will um, use about five or six days to do some sort of mopping up. So areas where they were unwieldy, areas where the commission thought that the people were not captured, there were some who were not captured, then we will use the mopping up period to do that. Okay. Now let's uh, come to the concern being raised by some the legalities of undertaking this exercise. Uh, we know that in 2012 we had to rely on a CI, a constitutional instrument, to undertake the exercise. And you mentioned that in 2016 it was more like a limited exercise that we, do. It, even that it needed a, a, a CI. Do we need a CI for this major compilation? And has that clearance already been given by Parliament? Thank you very much. Um, if you look at the CI 91, which is on registration. Um, we don't need a new CI because the CI captures exactly what the Commission wants to do. If you look at the fingerprint, if you look at what we call, and let me quote, mm. under interpretation section of regulation 32 CI 91, Biometric information has been defined to mean electronic template derived from the measurement and analysis of unique human body characteristics, including fingerprints, facial cuttings, eye retinas, and irises, and thumb print measurement for the purpose of establishing a person's identity. Welcome back. So you heard uh, from uh, Mr. Kofi Penso there speaking or reading out the statement issued by the coalition of 18 civil society organizations and subsequent conversations that came up there. Now <coughs> I'll be turning to the panelists in the studio now for us to have this conversation. I Thankfully we have one of the CSO um, one of the 18 CSOs who put out that statement here with us in the, in, 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 in the organization of SEND Ghana. And we have the country director here with us, Mr. Um, George Osebin. So I'll turn to you. Just give us <coughs> you know, the uh, introductory mm. you know, matters here and um, how it played out on the day. Because we, we, we're getting, if you like, maybe some conflicting signals as mm. in you were scheduled to meet with the EC, but then didn't you issue the statement, or you met with the EC and subsequently put out this statement and all of that. Let us know exactly what the situation is, even before we go into the nuances of your statement. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's very unfortunate, and um, we find it very insulting, uh, the publication put up by uh, Daily Guide, creating the impression that we went to um, a meeting with EC <coughs> um, with bad intentions. That that's not the truth. Yeah. So that, that's not the truth. So let me put out the facts. We have been working as a coalition, um, putting up our views on key national issues. Okay. You know, you may avert your mind to the issues of Auditor General and so many, so many other things. So when we had the, 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 the debate, we took a position to go into uh, you know, research to find out what the facts are 
what the issues are so that we could take a position. So we set up a committee as a coalition that looked into the issue and to do consultation because there are some of the key areas that we needed expert advice as well to uh, you know, firm <coughs> our position. So we were in the process and we had set our date for the release of the letter uh, only to get an invitation from EC that they wanted to meet us. So we said, oh, yeah, that's a very good opportunity because ideally they should have consulted us. But their letter, the tone of the letter was to tell us their plan, their, their timetable. Mm. Uh, so we wrote to the EC and said that we really like this. Can you put as an agenda item the issue of the new voters register so that we can discuss <coughs> it? So the EC more or less agreed because mm. even when we met them, they didn't even talk about their plan. They only talked about kind of justification for the new voters mm -hmm. register, which was good, almost like what we requested for. So we had taken our position already per the, 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 the report submitted by the committee that we set up. But we said that when we go into the meeting and we listen, when we listen to the EC and we are convinced, mm -hmm. we will meet the media and tell the media that having listened to the EC and having been convinced, we think that this is a great idea, so we support it. Mm. On the other hand, if we were not convinced, we were going to put out our statement. Mm. Of course, uh, if we needed to make any changes, we were going to make that. Mm. And that is why those of you, the media, who came to the center, we realized that we printed our statement right at the center because we're making changes based on the new information that we had, we had had. So it is never true, and we want the EC and whoever is putting out that kind of impression to respect us. That right. we had taken our position, we, we listened to them with open mind, we are ready, even ready to engage the EC further. And the EC itself committed uh, to that, and we are uh, ever open to that. And so it is never true that uh, um, um, we went there with our <coughs> statement, uh, I mean with our mind made up, we went there with an open mind, except that <coughs> we had prepared two weeks in advance, and okay. only the EC came to us 24 or two days to our, yeah. our, 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 the so you had your position statement. prior to meeting with the EC and having, saying that having research and listening to sure. the two sides and talking listening to, to the EC well. and talking to our expert, we had taken a position mm -hmm. based on a committee that we set up among right. ourselves. To and after meeting with the EC, you we felt, felt unconvinced very well. and for which reason we went ahead of our okay. statement. I think one of the issues that is coming out from the statement, which has, you know, raised uh, uh, some, if you like, controversy, mm. has to do with the issue about the NIA, mm. right? where you are suggesting, and I, I have it here, mm. that <coughs> you're saying that this is at page um, six of your statement, mm -hmm. after laying out the provisions of, you know, the Constitution, mm -hmm. then you go to the National Identification Authority Act, and then you conclude by, under that issue by saying that there's therefore clearly an authority backed by law to collect primary national identification data and to make it available for other state institutions, such as the EC, to compile from. In the past, when the NIA was not functioning, the EC clearly had the justification collect, to collect its own data, not now. So, <coughs> raising issues. Now, in here, we get the sense that the constitutional mandate of the EC, which is to compile a voter's register, mm -hmm. appears to be even under challenge, mm -hmm. i.e. that, well, there's now an authority mm -hmm. that should be doing the data collection and the EC should source that its information or source from the NIA, mm -hmm. whatever it is they need. The opposite, you know, <coughs> argument or the, the, the counter argument coming is this, that the NIA itself is struggling. Mm -hmm. For so long, it hasn't even been able to compile about how many, five million, you know, of, of, of collected data of, of the, five, about five million citizens. Mm -hmm. And yet we are expecting the EC to put its constitutional mandate of compiling a voters register, which it has been doing since 1992, mm -hmm wait for the NIA to now go and collect information from. Okay. This clearly is, 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 is a new <laughs> argument coming up and mm. which people find quite interesting. So yeah. what exactly informed that position? Okay, thank you very much. So um, I think that we need to put certain things into perspective. It is right to say that um, the NIA is superior <coughs> in the Electoral Commission in law. And I think in terms of what? Because it's, a, it's an authority. Hmm. 
and the, and the, and the EC, EC is, is a commission, a constitutional a commission. body. They are all constitutional bodies. No, the oh, wait, but the EC is a, a but you see, you see, the NIA is an authority. Yes, that in a legal statute. hierarchy, it is higher no, than the commission because it's, a, it's an authority. Okay. No, okay. okay. Well, anyway, I think we but, need to set but, the record but, straight. But, but the authority, the NIA, is set up by statute, mm -hmm. and the statute and the scheme of things is lower than the constitution. The constitution is at the top. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about a constitutional body, it is the EC no, but first before the statute which comes in. But, so but a, commission, a, a commission, commission cannot be said to be higher than an authority. But the point we are making is that when the law says shall compare, uh -huh. it doesn't mean we'll have to create and recreate new database all the time. Uh -huh. And especially when you have had um, a situation when the NIA is already in place, what prevents us from getting the NIA to you know, if you like, fast track it work. Mm -hmm. So that we avoid situations where we create parallel structures and we spend monies on the two that um, if we want to be efficient and prudent, we could get NIA to do, um, you know, a better work and fast track their work. The fact that they are moving at a snail pace is because they do not have all the equipment to cover all the country. I mean, I mean, ev everywhere at the same time, and that is why they have a, a program that you know they are they are they are staggering their pro their, 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 their project. So <coughs> all that we are saying is that one, if you look at what the EC is introducing, which is the facial um, recognition. recognition feature, it is in, it is inferior to what the NIA is capturing the 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 the, the, the iris. That is that is superior. So the, the, what is informing this position is that the NIA has a far more superior technology that would have, you know, help us to um, lessen the burden with the so-called uh, uh, manual verification. And so if you are introducing a new feature, you don't, you don't go for a less, um, what do you call it, a, an inferior feature. So <coughs> even what they are adding is not going to address the situation because what we, what we said was that if you look, if the, uh, um, the EC had consulted other experts, they would have been advised that um, a non-recognition uh, you know, rate of 0.6% is reasonable. And so you don't introduce an, a, a less inferior um, technology, which will only give you efficiency rate of around 80%. The NIA is capturing all of this. So what we are saying is that, and some of the things, we couldn't write everything on the, on, on, in the statement. I mean, those of you who were there, let, you know, were, were privy to the explanation. If we, 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 even if we want to get the superior feature, uh -huh. we can ask the NIA to stop whatever they are doing because already they are behind time, uh -huh. and give the <laughs> machines to the EC rather than for us to expend other resources to go and buy the same thing. So the and NIA, the, EC the proposal is for the NIA. It's in the scheme of things. Yes, this is it. That the NIA should put a hold on its work. We said Lend that even if we wanted. Lend its equipment to the EC. Of, of course, because and then the EC, you uh -huh. see, the solution the EC is providing <coughs> will not eliminate the issue of uh, manual verification. That's the point yes, we are making. but I think, uh, and of course, I'm uh -huh. not, and that I'm is not why we for say, the EC. That's why we say that the, 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 what the NIA is doing is far more superior that, that's fine. to what that's the fine. EC is but, proposing to but do. But Mr. Bimpe, here's the thing. <coughs> the EC maintains mm -hmm. that the primary mode of verification will mm -hmm. be the fingerprint. Mm -hmm. It is just that they are introducing the facial recognition mm -hmm. for those people who, by reason of their kind of occupation they mm -hmm. engage mm -hmm. in, are not able to have their fingerprints detected. Yeah. And for that matter, they would now need to do manual verification. And so at all material times, the facial recognition is not coming in to take over mm -hmm. the fingerprints um, um, mode of verification mm -hmm. that they've consistently said mm -hmm. that the first, the primary, is the fingerprint, mm -hmm. in which is the case. So finger facial recognition is coming in to basically complement when the need arises for those people who are unable to be verified, so that we don't necessarily go through the manual verifications. Mm -hmm. So it's not no. to say that they are trying to put facial recognition over and above. That's not what we are saying. Well, what, and when we met the ECA, we put this information to them, that you cannot say that the facial recognition is superior uh -huh. to the 
by the, the, the fingerprint said. verification. Yeah. The, 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 sec the second point I want to make is that we, the, the, the EC cannot guarantee us a 100% biometric authentication. And so if you are introducing a feature that would help us reduce um, the reasonable rate of um, non-recognition of the fingerprint, you have to introduce a far more superior technology or feature, which, would, which is not the facial one. And so what we are saying is that, that, yes, what we are saying is that even if they want to, they should consider a far more superior feature. That they have not done that. Mm. And so what they are going to do will be, as we say in Chi, because it is not going to solve the fundamental problem of non-recognition of the fingerprint. And that is what we put to them. And the EC admitted that. And so why would you want to go ahead and all add, spend all that well. money and add a feature that will not address a pro the problem, Ver the fundamental problem? Very well. Let me turn to Mr. Griffiths here yes. quickly. And uh, you, you heard the uh, position of the civil society organizations here. What do you make of it? Well, um, first of all, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, so I cannot, uh, you know, <coughs> put the arguments about the Constitution and what have you. But what I can speak to is the fact that somewhere in 2014, there was a process that started under the, uh, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama's administration, mm -hmm. when it emerged that all countries in the world need one civil biometric system just because it has security implications with everybody picking biometrics. And then also, the fact that these offices are very expensive, you know, and, and, and at that time, Ghana, we had bought 10 biometric systems, all civil, when we needed only one. And the worst part of it was that some institutions had paid for the same EFIS licenses in the same year, Bank of Ghana, had paid for the Sergeant Mofu license uh, through the e-switch program. And then at the same time, NIA had also paid for a Sergeant Mofu license for biometric you know, okay. fingerprint verification. So there was a moratorium placed on the procurement of AFISIS with the objective that we would have the NIA, an institution that is mandated okay. to deal with biometrics, Mind you, the Constitution did not say EC was to collect biometrics. So the objective of NIA was to establish an institution that was going to collect these ident basic identity information. And then everybody else, every institution who needs some identity information will pick that aspect from the National Identification Authority and build on their own institutional data that they need to, to, to deliver their mandate. So that was the objective of the establishment of the NIA, which was done initially done under President Kufo. Which is yet to be realized. Which is yet to be realized, mm. of course. The way the NIA has gone about this registration and all the bottlenecks of the breeder documents they selected is another matter which has led to the fact that we are here. There was a promise. The president read a speech on the 15th of, uh, 15th of September 2017, displaying his card and saying that 12 months from now, Ghani all Ghanaians will have their cards. And then today we are here. The same president read another speech 10 months ago saying 6.5 million Ghanaians have their card. So, I mean, there's a lot of work they have to do. But it doesn't take away the fact that the institution that is mandated to pick biometrics is the NIA. And this position was the position of the new patriotic party, which was espoused by the vice president of the Republic of Ghana, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. So I, 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 I see this as, you know, I think in the long term, as NIA has done their work well and has covered enough grounds, because don't forget, the NIA has a law that mandates the EC to pick, uh, to pick the LI 2111. That says all verification of identification has to come from the National Identification Authority. Banks. But here we are. I mean, let's just fast forward because 
the, the challenges of the NIA, uh, we all know. Yes. Currently, they have been unable to do what we all expected them to have done by now. Yes. Question is, given that circumstance, right. should the EC stop its work and say that we are going to, we are waiting for the NIA to finish its work. And then that, that obviously cannot what, be what? practical. Well, the, it would that be? I practical? think neither positions is my, ne neither of these two positions espoused is my position currently. Mm -hmm. I am of the view that all the reasons that the EC has given for a new voters register are made up. There is no iota of truth in the fact that the entire software and hardware systems are obsolete. And I have proof right here. No, that's fine. I, w we can get into that. But right I'm just here. asking. Currently, so, we're looking at the, so, the CSOs so, and their statement. Right. They put out this argument. I'm just seeking your thoughts on Can I say something? Because we are reducing our statement to the point we make on NIA. No, not no, at all. Not at all. Yeah. 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 You, do, you do recall that I said one of the issues you raised had to do with it. So we are going on progressively. The least of the issues. No, the least for of the me, issues. I don't think that's the least of the issues mm -hmm. because you were challenging the constitutional mandate of the EC, which for me, I thought was key. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how that's not I saw that. I that's impression. what it appeared to me, which no. is why I want us to look at it. No. And yeah. that's why we're carrying on with this discussion. Right. Obviously, we'll move into the okay. other areas because you raise issues about the costs as well. You're saying that if they had gone onto the market, they would have found better prizes, obviously raising value for money issues and all mm. of that. We'll definitely go into that. But for now, we're looking at the NIE argument. Mm. And I'm asking, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Griffiths, yes. definitely your position is, let's not even compile a new voters register exactly. at all. But I'm saying that this is what the CSOs have put out. Mm. Your thoughts on that? I just want to know what well, you make well, of Well, let, me, let me say that, that the, the Institution <laughs> Electoral Commission, its mandate is to manage elections. Another institution has the mandate to ma manage identity, to, uh, to do identity management. That so when the mandate. constitution says and it's to compile a voter's register and can do, uh, it can revise it from time to time, you think that means what? And in the, in the absence of, uh, 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 if you like, a centralized identification system, which is what the NIA is to bring about, what the, the AC is left, you know, I pretty much redundant not I think to move in terms of compiling. The portion that you have said, that makes this argument credible, is the fact that you are saying in the absence of ah, a centralized identification, that how, long is, to how long is that going to take? You see, l let me say this. The fact that you are mandated to compile a register does not mean that the constitution is saying anywhere. There's nowhere in the constitution where it says you should pick biometrics. There's nowhere in that constitution. Well, it's and let me let me and, and let me say this. Uh, and let me say this. The the go to other nations, the United States, or wherever, the United Kingdom. They compile registers, but they use existing. Because identity are, management yes. systems the two, the to build countries. on that for the, yes. the, the registers. But that's, you see, that's the system where they have what we are seeking to have. So, so that is why NIA. I'm telling we don't you. Have that, for now. That, that is why I'm telling you that NIA shot themselves in the foot when they themselves came up with the omission of the EC ID card from their breeder document. You see, all right. those things created but how the does bottlenecks. That affect the EC and, 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 and its role. And, well, the EC has no. In my position is that the EC has no excuse to compile a voter's register at all. Because so from 1992, when they were doing that, you're saying they did that without a mandate? No, that's not what I'm saying. So. I am talking about 20, compiling a voter's register in 2020. Mm -hmm. I never said that. In fact, the, a current biometric voter's register, which was compiled, started in uh, 2011. The procurement started in 2011. Oh. Contract was issued October, November 2011. You see, the EC keeps making excuses that they have compiled the voters register in election year before. That's not true. And then it is the mass registration that started 24th of March 2012. of 2012. Yes. We are here today. Is it 17th or 18th of 18 January? January. Yes. The contract for the, uh, these uh, software hardware vendors that they are talking about is still yes. not being signed. Very well. I you think, understand? I think you so we, we are yes. later than we were in 2012. Very well. And the ramifications of compiling the voters register late in 2012 led to us 
running the elections on two days. Uh, two, two, two days. Let's not forget point that. Point me, point mm -hmm. me, Mr. Griffiths. Let me quickly go to um, Honorable. Um, now let's start quickly. by providing a legal basis. Because I've even read from a lecture saying that this whole process is illegal. Let's start. <laughs> Otherwise, we start from there. They will have a basis to even argue on these things. In the first place, if you go to the Constitution, the functions of the EC are provided. Article 45 tells you what the EC should do, including really? compiling and a, a voter's yeah. register. Hey. Then you go to even 51, which says that the EC in compiling a register or even in conducting elections can come by a constitutional instrument to parliament. That is the basis of it. Okay. Now, based on that, if you look at the present constitutional instrument, CI-91, the first thing that you have to look at is qualification for registration. And then, when it comes to qualification for registration, it talks about a person who applies for registration as a voter shall provide as evidence of identification one of the following. That is the most critical thing. EC says we are compiling a register. Now, Parliament has approved the law. The law is saying that when you have to be registered, produce an identity that will make the EC register yeah. you. Then it's listed here. A passport, a driver's license, a national identification card, an existing voter identification card. And why you don't have any of this, even a guarantee form, guaranteed by persons who have proven to be voters. Mm -hmm. And this is a process we use. So if a national identification card is produced by a prospective uh, registrant, then you see we accept it. Whatever form it is, once it's proven that it's a national identification card, then you see we accept it. Mm -hmm. And once the EC accepts it, they register you. You bring a passport, it's proven that it's an uh, uh, authentic passport, then you see we register you. You bring a driver's license, they register you. So we should not be visited on just the NIA. If NIA hasn't completed the work, then EC cannot register. We should be very careful about that because the law has spelled out the identity you need to produce. And even where you don't have any identity, you should even have guarantors who can then make you register. That's the first point. Now, based on what people are saying that it's even illegal, if you go to the CI, the CI tells you very clearly that if you want to register a person, should take his biographic and biometric information. It's in the CI, Regulation 6. That's the uh, uh, registration assistant should take of this. CI 91. CI 91, you see mm. Regulation 6. Right. Then it goes on to say that you should take the fingerprints and the picture of the person with the ears and everything. Now, what should finish this whole debate is that if you go to the interpretation of what biometric information is. Regulation 32. It has defined biometric information. It says, means the electronic template derived from the measurement and analysis of unique human body characteristics, including fingerprints, facial cuttings, eye retinas, and irises, and tampering measurements for the purpose of establishing a person's identity. And just for the record, this CI was passed when? This year was is 2016. 2016, yes. This year is 2016. Mm. And this is the law that we are using. And by the way, when it comes to hierarchy of laws, it's the constitution first, mm. acts of parliament, it's subsidiary legislation, it. and then you talk about customs and all those things. So that should, I think, settle this whole debate about whether EC has even a legal mm -hmm. mandate to register persons. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, this NIA debate, it fits into this. And uh, you see, this thing started during President Kufo's time. When this whole NIA thing came in, there was this idea that they should compile um, or, or get the data for citizens, and that should be the basis for electoral rule. EC resisted and rejected it. Afrijan, I remember very well Afrijan saying that no, their mandate is to compile a register, and they will not leave that mandate to any institution. Mm -hmm. Nobody has been able to prove them wrong or challenge them in court. So we should be careful in thinking that NIA should be or should provide the data, then EC will pick it. Because that's what I get from their statement. Now, uh, Mr. Griffiths raised an issue about the fact that the LI for the, 
the NIA Act. Unfortunately, it makes, puts a requirement on other institutions to I ha, I, source. I haven't checked, but if you know, I haven't checked, but even if it's true, even if it's true. A substantial legislation can override a constitutional mm -hmm. provision. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it's true, no, just a minute. Let I mean, if, if it's true, yeah. because the constitution is very clear, and nobody has been able to challenge the, the status and the functions of the EC under the constitution. Mm. So if we do an ally, and for any reason, in doing the ally, we able we we want to. It runs contrary to the provision yes. of the constitution. Yes, that, that, that is yeah. unconstitutional. Yeah, which 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 act is that? That's is, we need to take a break though, but let me know what act that is. I've told you, when we but before <laughs> the ally. And I uh, have said I'm still on the uh, floor. I'm not going to on the floor. But <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, I just needed that intervention to come 11. through. So L I twenty one eleven, which is a re re the um, uh, regulations for the N I A Act. Sure, yes. I, I will take a look at that. But honourable, please yes. so wrap up for me so we take a break. Really, then the, the CSOs are saying that we go into other things, but um, even the N I A thing, there appears to be a contradiction. What they are saying is that we rely on N I A. At the same time, they are saying that it's taking NIA three years to compile what you are supposed to compile. So what makes you think that within a year, you can do your registration without stress? Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. Right. And I'll turn to Jonathan Asantiotri to make his submissions uh, on this. Uh, you, you've listened to your, your, your co-panelists, <laughs> you know, argue uh, on a number of issues here. Your, 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 your perspective, your thoughts on this whole conversation? Well, uh, <coughs> I... I wouldn't even want to go in that direction. Uh, <laughs> Which direction is yes, that? The NIA business, the and all those. Uh, I think that um, I've said on countless uh, occasions that look, um, if the EC wants to do something that most of the people think it is inappropriate, we need to <coughs> voice that v grievance. Uh, secondly, I'm of the view that um, the timing that they intend to do something of this sort is still wrong. Uh, we don't really, really have enough time on our hands to discuss the compilation of an entirely new register. Uh, I've also argued that, look, the cost involved is, is something that, as a nation and a country that is even preparing to get a diasporian you know, bond of about $3, $3 billion, we need to be prudent in our expenditure. In as much as we want to protect our democracy, uh, what we have as of now, I'm not too convinced that it is a uh, useless data that will need entirely something new, something different, as it were. Now, the but final... they're saying that they are experts. They've consulted their experts and they've uh, advised them. And the previous yeah. vendor had also, um, you know, made suggestions pointing to the direction they are currently pursuing. And so when you say you are not convinced, on what basis are you? Do you have facts that we don't know about, or facts contrary to what the EC is, has put out? Yes, uh, I will just answer that question by saying that the eminent body met the EC. Now, the communication that they came out with indicated that the body is not entirely convinced. No, they haven't said that. I'm not saying they've said that. It's a communication wise, it is not everything that they put out there. They, they can't say that. They say that continue with engagement, mm -hmm. do further consultation, mm -hmm. because there is, there is more opposition to the whole process. Oh. So probably, in terms of communication, they may, they, may, they may not have been able to communicate their issues well to the public. Two, probably they've not been able to demonstrate transparency. And all these things are full in suspicion. So the whole thing is about suspicion. And believe it or not, um, it is either whatever they intend to do, politically, somebody will say that, look, you want to create an advantage for an opponent. How? Whether it is a truism or a falsity. That perception you cannot take away from them. They have already, the opposition has already been making such pronouncements. And I, I even had one just yesterday. And that wouldn't be the first. That, that wouldn't be the first. Co consistently, the EC is caught between the two yes. the parties. And interestingly, it, it would appear mm -hmm. that the party in power would have its um, thinking mm -hmm. be the same, if you like, or similar to, coincidentally, mm -hmm. I, I should yeah. say. It's not surprising. But yes, so it's not necessarily <laughs> the case that this is the first time 
that yeah, it we is are not. what it is. Yeah, it is not. But it's, it's ironical that when one finds yourself in opposition, the language is different. Uh, when one finds himself in government, the language the communication is different. I mean, well, we have been in this country. We are not born. We are. We are not born yesterday. Look, sometimes the has also been consistent with the opposition from 2016. We'll come to that, honourable. Let let Mr. Ochi. See, I mean. It's as if you, they then become the communication authority for, for the EC whenever one party finds itself in government. So I will even advise that, look, whatever is going on now, I will advise the ruling party to more or less not to be making certain pronouncements as it were to suggest that uh, they, are, they are in line with the EC. Let the EC do their own communication. That shouldn't be your business. You see, but because you are government in power, this is a state institution. If you sit idle and it is, you know, bastardized, more or less, you know, it creates some kind of problem. And so one way or the other, you see them coming for to defend or something I, like I that. I do so. appreciate what you're saying, yeah. but here's the case. I mean, the fact is, it's an undisputed one, that in 2016, the NPP's position, which they hold now, hasn't changed. I mean, it was the same as it is today. And so, so is the NDC's position. The NDC back then said, no, we don't need to compile a new voters register. The NPP back then said, we, let's, let's, let's compile a new voters register. So if now it co coincidentally appears to be the same thinking of the EC, would you necessarily say then that they shouldn't necessarily, as a party, advance their course, which is that we want a, voter, uh, a new voters register? You see, uh, my dear sister, the, the, the politics of the whole thing is that once somebody is playing the card of a victim in politics, they will have the majority of the people siding with them. Hmm. Now, the MPP is in power. It is dangerous on their part for a perception to be created as though they are in bed with the EC. That is they're very dangerous for them. And the victims are always in the majority, the poor, everything. They will side with the opposition. <laughs> as if somebody is creating a platform for another person to rig. That may not be the case. Do you get the point? And so that perception that is created is dangerous. But I will finally say that, look, uh, EC may have the right to do A, B, C, and D. The timing is wrong. If after we are done with the creation of the, the six new regions, they have decided to go ahead with maybe we'll have had ample time to do something of that sort. Mm. So irrespective of the innocence of heart of the EC, you know, apart from the political bantering that takes place between the between the both sides, irrespective of the innocence of heart of the EC, somebody somewhere will be suspicious. Now I'm not I'm I am I would not in any way suggest that what the CSOs have come out with can be rubbished. No, you do that at your own peril. For such respectable think tanks to come out with such a statement, then it means that there is the need for us to delve deep into the issues affecting the EC and the whatever they intend to do. You see, so I will, I will just uh, entreat the EC that it, it may be broken, mm. but it is not spoiled. Uh, whatever the data that they have, I will equally entreat them that the timing for this particular project or exercise is not right. right. Uh, you may even let people go into a wild speculation that probably somebody somewhere is going to benefit from the whole project, more or less. And that is the more reason why they are insistent. Mm. You know, other than that, if the biometric feature that we've been using, the data is still intact, I think that the only thing we can do is to just to upgrade or up the mm. system. Well. And then we can go ahead with our o elections. On that point, I move to um, Mr. Bimper here about the upgrade versus the new acquisition. Now, the okay. EC mm -hmm. maintains that it would cost more mm -hmm. to upgrade or refurbish mm -hmm. than to acquire a new one. So in the, when we are talking about, um, I think Mr. Ochiasanti talked about the fact that, yes, as given the kind of economy we have, of course, a, a, a country that runs always on a, a deficit budget, we probably should be more prudent in our ways. And obviously, this argument sh should be more tenable then, that if it's going to cost more to refurbish or upgrade mm -hmm. than to acquire a new, why don't we opt for the one that would give us, uh, you know, w w w w would make us some savings? Okay. But you're saying, you're disputing those statements or those figures that the EC has put out, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. 
Okay, so thank you very much. But just before um, before I do that, let me clarify something. <laughs> we have we have not said that the EC does not have the constitutional right or power okay. to <coughs> compile data. What we are saying is that compile doesn't mean create a new one. Oh. Compile means that there are existing sources that you can. And we only cite the NIA as one of the possible sources. And I want to make that statement clear so that we, 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 we understand it from where we are, we are coming from. That is what the statement we are making. Now, on to the, 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 the mm -hmm. question that you ask. We arrive at our, decision, uh, our position because the EC appears to make um, a technical justification on the basis uh, that their current system is vulnerable. And we are saying that you cannot arrive at that decision based on an advice by a single or a limited uh, source. Did, did the EC avail itself of um, the opportunity to you know, get other vendors apart from the STL? And the, the EC seem to be relying a lot on the correspondence that the STL sent to them. That Co and their consultants, their, 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 the EC's own IT. Where is that information? Where, where is that information? Have they put that information <laughs> um, from that the, 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 their consultant in the public? Yes. The only information that they have put in the public is the letter, uh, the supposed letter written by STL. No. And so we are saying that you cannot arrive at such a technical decision based on a narrow set of uh, vendors advising you. Let's even add their consultant. That makes it true. You cannot arrive at a decision based on what to only two vendors uh, you know, potential two vendors are advising you. So they could have done a more extensive consultation from different aspects to arrive at that decision. They say they conduct the market research also. The, 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 the point, the second, the second point that we are making is that even the STL that you are on whose uh, correspondent you are relying, you have discredited. And you are not working with them. So why would you rely on an institution that you have discredited? And the, but, if the like EC the, the, the discrediting mm -hmm. was in respect of certain, if you like, um, I think that has to do with the proprietary matters where they couldn't necessarily, the EC couldn't have access to certain details and no, all sister, of that. But it's not black, about the competence. Yeah, it's not about the no, competence the point, the of the, the vendor. Point we are making, no, you see, if they, per our benchmark study that we did, the price they are, they are quoting are too high. Mm. For example, if the, the SCL is quoting the BVRs at $5,145 for a, new, a complete new set, if they want to refurbish, they are saying $3,500. For the uh, BVDs, they are quoting $917 for new ones, and then for refurbishment, $244. Pay them um, the, 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 the uh, what do you call it? The, benchmark, uh, the, bench, uh, the market benchmark study that we did. The, the, the BVL, BVLs can be, be gotten at about 2,500. Uh, 2,500, so where from this figure? This, this is because the EC did not avail itself of other, the uh, views of wow. other vendors. And so to arrive at that decision, that in itself is problematic. Now let us come to the issue of the hardware. You cannot <laughs> say that all the BVLs and the BVDs are completely obsolete. The EC need to tell us how many of them? Because we also are aware that only in 2016, the EC spent $4 million, $4 million to procure new BVRs and BVDs. Are they putting all of this into one basket to say that they are all obsolete? That cannot certainly be true. So they need to come clear to the public and tell us, we have 100 BVRs, 100 BVDs. This number of them are no law, are no defective, law. are irredeemably <coughs> defective, for which reason we need to replace them. But to say that you are throwing them away, hmm. knowing that we have only used them less than two months ago. <coughs> and when you use them, the, the non-recognition rate was only 0.6%, which is reasonable. <laughs> so you, there is no justification to throw all those things away. And that is the point we are making. Very well. Okay. So okay. That, that, that's fine. Oh, no, no, I, I will come to <laughs> Unless he is in response. Drama. He's a technical. Mine, he's going to speak. is related to what sure. he said. Very well. First of all, I like to support what my brother has said, that so far... All the technical issues the EC has raised are false. They are not correct, and they are made up just to justify this needless adventure that they want to take the nation on. And I will take a few and then give you evidence. 
to begin with, <coughs> let me go to where they have said that their software is obsolete. I know you have a lot to, to share, but you see, our time is limited, yes. so I would want you to package it yes, I will in package a way it. that you know I will, will be. I will do that yeah. for you. <laughs> if you look at uh, their press statement, they said that their software is obsolete and that Red Hat Linux has stopped supporting their version, which is 5.8, mm -hmm. version 5.8. I have here, this is from Red Hat Enterprise Linux release dates. And if you look at this page here, it gives you the release date as 2012. Red Hat supports their versions for 10 years. No, no, I, that. Well, but, that. I can't but, but the but link, the link that, is so here. I will give you a copy as a matter of fact. I made a copy for you. This is it. <laughs> I actually made a copy for no, you. That's okay. fine, so that you can verify, verify it as I'm here. Mm -hmm. So I they, 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 they are saying that mm -hmm. the, the release date is 2012. So it is 2022 mm -hmm. that it will actually, they will start supporting it. And even in 2022, when they start supporting this, you can upgrade to uh, a higher, uh, uh, higher version, more uh, current versions. Mm -hmm. They are saying that their fingerprint scanner is not, support, uh, is not certified by FBI. And I'm saying that is false. This is data sheet for the current fingerprint scanner. It says that the scanner is certified by FBI for civil identification and EFIS applications. This is here. I will leave this one to you. But is this in respect you. of the EC? The, 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 the big, these are the all the things that EC have put together yeah. as uh, reasons this, why. This, Te these are technical reasons. I, I, I get that. Mm. I appreciate that. But I'm asking if this, thi this thing here you're referring to is in respect of the EC system that they're talking yes. about. Yes. They are saying they want to go FBI certified system. Mm -hmm. It says it is certified for civil APHIS, which is what the EC system is. Okay. There are two types of APHIS, <coughs> the civil one and the criminal one. This one here, the EC's own is a civil APHIS. The criminal APHIS, they roll the prints. You yeah, understand? You're, you're so, going so, so technical. I mean, yes, I I, can't well, the, the debate has gotten to that level where we have to show some of these things. Where we have to show some of these things here. Then they say that there hasn't been uh, uh, capacity building for their EC staff. staff yeah. That is false. Cap they have built, uh, they have trained EC staff, not only EC staff, EC also brought a private company, Fairgreens. They are technical men <coughs> to be trained, and they were trained at the cost of 333,500 US dollars. And the training comprised of the database itself and the, all the various systems. If the EC is also claiming here, that they don't have keys to the database. Now, if they did not have the passwords to the database, they could not have run the system in 2019 because STL's contract was abrogated in 2018. And I want to put it on record that they do have the passwords. That is why they were able to run uh, the, the elections for the district, level, uh, the district level elections. I've talked about the enterprises. Let us go back to the most important aspect, because if you claim vendor locking, then you are saying that your images are not present in a database. And let me also state that the EC said this to IPAC, that their images are not present. They should not forget they are dealing with the multinational, Jenkins. The images of the prints <coughs> are present. No, but this is not a time and attendance system. This is a national database. Mm. Nobody deletes the images of the prints. The images are not only the images present, but they are also coded in standard format as their own system requirements detected before they went into contracting. Mm. The EC also said that they had to perform what they call end of life. Now, let me explain end of life properly because this here took the whole nation into a uh, you know, term world that was we unnecessary. Let me, break, so I need let, let, me, let me explain end of life carefully. Quickly. Can you explain that? In when you have finished a, a registration process, like the limited <coughs> registration process, when you have finished, before you finalize the provisional register to be sent to the field, you need to bring all your machines to the center. And then you back up all the data on that machine. And then you put it in. The reason being that there can be human errors. So there are so many reasons is why. That your definition of end of life. Well, that is the EC's own definition no. of end of life. I'll prove it to you. Well, Mr. Please. I have letters yet. I, I have proved it. I'll prove <laughs> it to you. Please, 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 please. To me. I have some yet. Please. Mm -hmm. let, let me finish. Well, no, no, I'll come to you. Let, let me finish. Mr. Mr. Please be let me finish for me. Oh, no, no, no. It's not that. It's not It's not the end of life as you're running out of time. It's not the hard way of life. It's not the hard way of life. Just a minute. No, no, no. Let me clarify this. It is not the end of life of the equipment. So if this I is a, this is, you, this, is, this, is, this is a process called end of life. 
yes, that they do as they part of their them. process. No, 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 no. It's, please, let me finish. You see where I'm going from. Let me finish. We will see where I'm coming from. If you could just wrap up for me, please. Now, now the EC the told us that the reason why there was so much confusion on uh, uh, exhibition during the exhibition period was mm. that they, 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 a lot of data was missing. And they had to now come and bring their machines and back up the data from the hard drive. That process they call end of life. Different from the end of life of equipment they are talking about. I'm talking about the process end of life. Check this out. The EC knows the end of life process is mandatory in their data processing uh, uh, workflow. And they did that in 2012. They have done that every time. And in the new system they are going to procure. They have also budgeted for end of life in, in their budget. Let's 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 take it a is break right here. here. I think Let let's take so. a break here. Well, well I'm we, just, this we is need it. To take a break. This is it. End of life processing. Yeah, so, so if you are telling me that you are using end of life as the reason why this system must be thrown away, why have you budgeted for budgeted for it in the new this thing? I'll go to honourable Obi Amwan now for him to uh, make you. some. You want to make some? Thank uh, you. you my want my to respond my yes, yeah. thank you. Abraham. My <laughs> primary um, comment will be that as stakeholders in this whole business. We refuse to be gagged. That statement and impression is that, hey, are you speaking for EC? Let them speak. Otherwise, they'll say they are, they are in your pocket. That one, we will not agree. We have been consistent in how the system should run for fairness and everything. Since day one, since 1992, whether it's a box or a color a ID card, even in 2000, 2000 when that government was in power, they rather ran to court that the EC should be allowed to use black and white pictures instead of color pictures. They lost in court. The most important thing is that we are saying that if the system is robust, if the system is good, it doesn't inure to the benefit of any group. And that's what we have been saying from day one. And we are stakeholders. After all, if the EC wants to conduct registration exercise today, do you know how much cost the party will incur? But we say that because we will incur cost, they should, they should come out, when they have come out to say that the system is, is moribund, then we say, okay, go ahead. It's the same people who come and say that they used to use a fraud system to run their lessons, and because of that, those who have won, they, 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 they didn't win it fairly. We've been in this country, we went to court, let's see, petition, eight months. What did the court say? Even for the register, EC couldn't justify how they registered 251,000 people abroad. They only brought 700. It's in the judgment of the Supreme Court. <coughs> so please, people should be careful in saying that when it comes to these things, we as a stakeholder, we should keep quiet because if the moment you speak, it means you are speaking for EC. We are not speaking for EC. EC, they have their own persons to speak for them. But why you sit and say that if, if uh, at the end of the day, even if, if they do it, uh, to show that uh, they want to favor the government in power. We have been consistent since opposition days. That we want a better system. When we get a better system, everybody can go to sleep. That's number one. Number two. So, so what will you say if the EC declines later on to continue with the registration? What the will EC, be your communication? When, when the EC in 2016 and before made certain decisions that we were not happy about, we went to court. The National Identification Authority card. We went to court. The court agreed with us. So if we think the EC is taking any step that we are not happy about, we will go to court. The court will interpret it. And we'll take it. That's our attitude every time. So please, don't bother to create the impression that uh, because uh, new issues in, they are coming to favor us. What are the verifiable issues? What are the facts for anybody to say that EC is favoring anybody? But that doesn't mean that when they are first, they won't talk. We will talk. Secondly, if you talk about the existing vendor, this vendor has been in place since 2011. <coughs> They've run two elections for us. In their own statement, they are even talking about 47% failure. You see here. 47% failure rate for BVRs. This is, this is it. You can see it. The term is being misused. That, that we will please. Will you make it, you please. Make uh, to the extent that those people who are supposed to provide them the equipment. This is what we want to have said. We would like to announce that items in the present BVRs are end of life including laptops this means that no components are available for repair items this is it you can see it so what the ec has come to tell us in parliament 
This is the statement. What the EC has come to tell us in Parliament, for which we have approved, approved funding for them, is that we want to conduct very fair, transparent elections in 2020. But we are handicapped. The handicap is in so many aspects. The BVD system, the BVR kit, the network system, the data center, BVMS, even operational issues. So I approve this funding for us. And these are the steps we are going to take to make the system robust for free and transparent elections. Parliament, they appeared before the uh, uh, Special Budget Committee. They interrogated them. Indeed, it got to a point. They said, EC should bring more documents. EC went to bring all these documents that I have here. Show you here. At the end of the day, <coughs> our, our friends in the minority made all the arguments. When it came to voting, they said they won't vote. And they walked out for the majority to vote. And that, that wasn't the first time. Even the NIA, they walked out. And even told the whole world that nobody should subscribe to the national identification card. Right. They told us. So, no, I have a time. I have a time. No, but we don't have time. We don't have time. We have two minutes. Because this major issue of verification, this major issue of verification during exhibition, it's a major because the CEOs have made a point. Why don't you open it? People should go and look at their names and delete those who don't. I know, come we have to a verify. minute and a half to wrap up. Yes. Please. And then we, we use the remainder why, to why just don't you go around. Use a exhibition to clean the mm -hmm. register. Those who don't come and verify, you delete their names. I'm saying that I still don't find a legal basis for what they are saying. EC has conducted registration exercise. They opened the register. People went to. And in any case, it's not by force. It's not uh, mandatory that doing a exhibition, everybody should go and check his name. The fact that you don't go and check your name doesn't mean that EC can remove your name from the register. That will be a recipe for chaos. So assuming they have 16 million registered voters, only 5 million go and check. Then the remaining uh, okay. uh, 11 million, you take out your names because they haven't come to verify. This is a recipe for disaster. And I don't think that the civil society organization should pursue this line. Honorable. Point. Uh, I, I think haven't finished. No, but, no, no, but we, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, yeah, so you you, you, you have had more, no, no, more no, no, minutes no, 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 no. because it says talking technical. I have to. No, 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 no. I have to. I I just, you've, no, you've responded, which is fine. But I just need to ask a question. Yes. And of course, you're not speaking for the EC. Yes. But as a stakeholder yes. with interest in this issue, yes. where the EC claims that it has a report by its IT consultants. Yes. And there's been a demand for that report. Uh, let's see that report so that we can Absolutely. verify that indeed this is the case. The EC to date has refused to make that report available. Who, who is what demanding, do you, who is what demanding do you, it? And the stakeholders, obviously, members in, of IPAC. In, if, I, and including the MPP. That's what I'm saying. So we do you think it's, it's proper Secretary. that Absolutely. the EC keeps that report away? They say, let's see that report and then we can verify what? ourselves and then we can, you know, perhaps reach a consensus. And then we can all move I'll forward. But until I'll to what? date, no. that has not been, been See, done. What, Just what you're saying is on that, that and then we have no, as, as one you, minute As you said from the beginning, yes. what you're saying is that the EC has not made that report available. Yes, that's, that's, has yeah, it made it available? Or whatever. It's up to EC to prove But what that. do you think? Should they make Why it available? Why not? Good. They should. Why okay. not? And because they haven't done because that. Because when that's it right. came to Parliament, every document that Parliament asked for, they submitted Good. it. So in, in so helping the process of consensus yes. building, yes. that why should not? be made available. I don't have any problem at all. Well. I think we need to be wrapping up. I give a minute. I need that to confirm that indeed. I give a minute. Look, this is a report. I can give you this report. The club report of 2015. I would love to If you read this report, you, you will marvel. Thank you. I would, I, 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 would, I, would, I would pick that. 2015, set that as a wrapping up. Say. Let me have... Yeah, well, I don't know, let you me have it. it. <laughs> huh? You oh, said oh, I read. You can, you can okay. 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 So, so, a minute. To begin with, let oh. me indicate... I'm sorry, I have to turn No, no, no. I have to turn off. You make your point that I have to... We're going round the table, honorable. Round the table, one minute each. Please, let me indicate that... One minute. The new patriotic... Please, please. I don't... My minute hasn't started yet. Oh, it started. Okay, let me state that my brother saying the new patriotic party has been consistent in these EC matters is false. Number one. Let us talk about the genesis of this voters register that we yes. are saying they are ob it's obsolete now. Yes. One, the new patriotic party through candidate Nanado Danko Akufuado yes. made a claim that we should go by metric for registration, for verification, and yes. even e-voting. Yes. The first, uh, the first uh, forum was uh, was organized by Dankwa Institute, yes. and the IEA called all stakeholders. Yes. Where 
Madame Jane Mensah is was the leader yes. of uh, IEA. Oh, yeah. Now, the arguments that were made yes. was that one, there will be no duplications in the register. Two, that it is permanent, yes. so it will cure the periodic changing of the register. Yes. Number three, even if deceased people remain on the register, unless your name is Lazarus and you happen to be around during Jesus Christ's time, you cannot come and vote. Yes. Therefore, it is important to go by metric to uh -huh. save, yes. to have a cleaner uh -huh. register uh -huh. and to save the nation of uh -huh. needless changes right. in the register. Yeah. They turned around after a few years and came up with 14 petitions against the same register that they had. But if we find it flawed, can How did they find it flawed? Very well. Very well. Very well. Your time is up. Then again, I still have something to do. George Bimper is on the floor, please. What is it consistent? It's inconsistent. No, no, no. Please. This isn't ITAC. What is it consistent about it? Mr. Osei Bimper, carry on. Mr. Bimper has a lot. Bimper. Sorry, Bimper. Don't change my destiny. 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 Don't we cannot say that we will address um, uh, the so-called uh, bloated voter by a new register because people will always die. The politicians, if they can commit to Ghana that they will not that's support, a, a they will not, they, they will not support minors, they will not facilitate minors to register. The politicians will have to the commit to Ghana. Are children of people. Mm -hmm. Are they also politicians? Mm -hmm. The, the politicians will have to do people. that. The, the second mm -hmm. point I want to make is that's that bad. the third point I want to make is that. If we have to replace BVRs and BVPs, it doesn't mean that thank we you. need a new voter what register. Very well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr. And they can be yeah. changed at any time. Uh, 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 well, please, uh, Mr. Griffith, you've uh, had your piece. You know, um, <laughs> if, if, if you go <laughs> on, if you look at the whole thing, you'll be continuing, you'll be continuing with the banter. I think sure. that we, we need to end somewhere. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think they have an IPAC meeting. Come, Coming up, come yeah. Monday. I think that I will entreat all to go with open heart and open mind. Mm -hmm. And let them listen. Uh, we need to find out how this is going to display the feasibility and the practicability of the whole process okay. so that in the end we will find a way out of the whole issue. Very well. I should have had you speak last because you've given a nice yeah. benediction. But Honorable is coming. <laughs> for now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, for us, our major focus is to prepare for the elections. If, at the end of the day, as EC has said, the opening the register, we are ready. We are training our people. Okay. We go to the field, get involved, and make sure that as many people as possible exercise their rights to register. Thank you. And then to be able to convince them that come 2020. Go and Thank vote. you very much. On that note, we draw the curtains on the show today. It's been an exciting one as usual. Thank you to you for making a date with us, our viewers, our listeners, and to the panelists, Honorable Obi Amwa. Mr. Osei Kwame Griffith, Mr. George Osei Bimpe, and Mr. Jonathan Asante Ochoe. We'll see you here same time next week. Do have yourself a very good weekend. Bye-bye.